Hello, welcome to the UT Health East Texas Virtual Education Series. Today's presentation topic is Atrial Fibrillation, New Solutions for an Old Problem, featuring Dr. Andrea Cooley, Board Certified Cardiothoracic Surgeon at UT Health East Texas Cardiovascular Institute. Hi there, my name is Dr. Cooley and today I'd like to talk to you about atrial fibrillation and we're going to talk about some new solutions to an old problem where everybody has pretty much heard of AFib and so you're probably wondering why is a surgeon talking about AFib of all the things I could talk about that are exciting and interesting AFib doesn't seem to be the one that would typically pop into your mind. So here's my answer. AFib is extremely common. You may have AFib. You probably know someone who has AFib. We see TV commercials all the time for the treatment of AFib. You hear people talk about it all the time. So what does everyone usually say? They say, oh, I had to deal with a little bit of AFib. Or it's okay, I just had a little episode of AFib. I got over it. I got some medicines. So not really a big deal. For decades, the medical profession has had that impression that AFib is more of a nuisance. It's not one of our major heart diseases. It's not really a big deal. We just kind of have to deal with it, deal with the symptoms and make sure we don't have any major problems from it. Over the past few years, uh, we've realized that AFib is actually a major problem. It's a really big deal. It's becoming more and more common and it has a lot bigger impact on our health than we really appreciated in the past. Because of this, there has been research pouring into AFib as far as what causes it, how does it work, why is it so tricky to try to control and correct, and what are things we can do to try to stop AFib besides the typical old things we always tried. So that's what we're going to get into today, finding out ways to fight AFib through all the different stages. So when I said AFib is a, is a big deal and it affects a lot of people, here's what I mean. AFib affects in the U.S. about 6.1 million patients today. We put this in perspective by understanding that all cancers combined aren't even this, this big number. So AFib is affecting more patients than cancer does. In the next 25 years, we're expecting this number to double. So it's becoming an accelerated problem in our, in our population. Right now, about 9% of people over the age of 65 are walking around with AFib. That's almost one out of every 10 people. When we're looking forward to the next generation, so people who will be 65 in 20, 25 years, so my crowd, 40 year olds right now, we actually expect it to be one out of every four people will have AFib. So we realize we need to stop this problem now as it's accelerating, we need to put, put some brakes on it. Currently, the U.S. spends about $26 billion a year on the treatment for AFib. And as we all are very aware of healthcare costs right now, um, you can see why that is a big deal. So trying to stop this is important from that standpoint, but also really how patients do. So if, again, if it's just something that's a nuisance and yeah, a lot of people have it, well, you know, a lot of people sprain their ankles too, we wouldn't think it was that big of a deal. But we know now that AFib, patients who have that, actually have a five times higher risk of stroke. Their risk of having heart failure is three times higher. And their risk of dying from an early cardiac death is actually two times higher. So very significant. Around 2014 and 2015, some new research started coming out. And they showed several studies looking at people who had AFib for the first time, and it was bad enough they had to get put in the hospital to try to control it, try to make their symptoms better, um, and try to get that fast heart rate under control. So they looked at these people for about five years to see how they did. And really shockingly, they, they did not do as well as we thought they typically should. So they had high rates of heart failure, they had high rates of strokes, heart attacks, they had bleeding problems like GI bleeds from having to be on blood thinners for AFib. But most frighteningly, about 50% almost, so 48.8% of these patients actually passed away within five years of that first admission for AFib. So this really caught the attention of people in the medical profession to say, wait a minute, this is a big deal. We really need to look at this more closely. So this is why all this research started. Interestingly, AFib is a uniquely American disease. So that's not to say it doesn't happen in other countries, other regions of the world, but 
it is two to three times higher in the U.S., and we can thank our American lifestyle, our diet, our activity, our other medical problems we have for that really big boost in AFib. So this is compared to similar um, developed countries, countries throughout Europe. Uh, we're much higher than them, but it's also even comparing it to developing nations. So nations in Africa, South America, they're doing much better than we are on AFib. You can see from this map, as I'm sure we're used to actually looking at similar maps right now with COVID of you know darker colors means it's more severe. If you look into our little East Texas zone here, you can see that East Texas has some of the highest hospitalization rates for AFib in the country. So especially in our area, we need to take this very seriously. And luckily we have some new options to really get after this and take care of people. So in order to talk about AFib and what it does to the heart, we need to understand what's normal for the heart. And I'm a surgeon, so of course I'm gonna talk about anatomy because it's one of my favorite things. So. When you're looking at the heart, we wanna think about it from left to right and from top to bottom. So when we're thinking about left to right, we're talking about what side of the heart pumps to where. So our right side of the heart gets all of our old blood that's used up, all the oxygen has been used by our cells. We get that back to our, from our body to the right side. The right side then squeezes it into our lungs, the lungs put oxygen in, and then it goes into the left side, which can then squeeze it out to our body. So it's just a loop, it just keeps doing that circuit over and over. When we're talking about top to bottom, that's when we talk about the, our two types of heart chambers. So there's an atrium and there's a ventricle. An atrium is a collecting chamber. So that's where blood comes in, collects before it goes to the ventricle. So you can think about that like a regular building. When you walk in from outside into an atrium, you're coming from outside in, you have a bunch of people collecting and waiting for, to go on to their destination, exactly like an atrium in the heart. Once it goes through the heart valve into the ventricle, that's when the ventricle can squeeze hard and get it out to its destination. Now when we think of that heartbeat, we think of that typical sound, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. That's our two, our top and our bottom squeezing. So lub atrium, dub ventricle, lub dub, lub dub. Okay, so they do it in order like that. Now your heart has its own pacemaker system and that's some nerves within, within the heart that act right, like an electrical circuit. So we have our own natural one. Of course, we've all heard of pacemakers where we put in an artificial one if yours isn't working. But your natural pacemaker starts at the top of your atrium, on the very top of your heart. The job of the pacemaker is to control your heartbeat, so how fast your heart beats, your pulse, and it also controls the heart rhythm, which is the pattern your heart goes in. So we wanna make sure, our goal is to have it nice and a regular pattern, just like a ticking clock, and make sure everything's nice and coordinated because that's very efficient for your heart. We have thousands and millions of heartbeats to have in our lives, so we wanna make sure that every heartbeat's as, as efficient as possible so that heart can last as long as possible. Now, just like regular electrical engineering, this is a circuit. So the electrical signal starts, it passes through the muscle, which is conductive. So the muscle tissues pass it along and it moves through the heart, and then it goes in a circuit and repeats. The very beginning of that circuit starts, like I said, at the top of the heart, something called the sinus node. That's why when we have a regular heart rhythm, we call it a normal sinus rhythm. So you may hear that phrase if you've been dealing with AFib, your doctor may say, oh, we're in a sinus rhythm. That's what our goal is, that's normal. So as it starts going through, we have the sinus rhythm starts, it sends it down to the atrium, and then it hits this new spot in the heart called the AV node, and that's when it gets to the ventricle and it catapults it around the ventricle to cause a good heart squeeze. Okay, so lub dub, lub dub, that's what we're working on. The way I think about how it works with a coordination is if you're at a stadium and you see people doing the wave, everybody is waiting for their turn, the signal starts here and the, the crowd goes, stands up, goes all the way through and then it goes around and starts again. That's exactly how our conduction works. So we call that in medicine, we call it a wave propagation. Okay, so we're moving that wave of electricity through the heart and watching that heart contract. If you think of movies you've seen where someone's walking up to an electrical fence, what happens when they touch it? They grab it, right? So that electricity makes muscles contract. So that's exactly what happens as it's going through the heart. 
So that's normal. That's our normal sinus rhythm. Then let's talk about what happens in AFib. So AFib, the A stands for atrium, so atrial, and fibrillation means wiggle. So when you have AFib, there's a cluster of cells somewhere in that atrium that decides to go haywire for whatever reason, okay? So we have our normal signal that's supposed to come from the top of the heart, but then we have this little renegade signal somewhere else that starts sending out impulses. So as these waves start propagating and these waves start propagating, they start running into each other. So things get very chaotic, um, they aren't coordinated anymore, and instead of squeezing, it just wiggles, okay? When you think of kind of what a, a wiggle would be, think of that really annoying twitch you can get in your eyelid when you're tired. That is one little cell, one little area just going bad, going renegade and going haywire and having its own twitch. So it's twitching away, but it's not doing anything to help you actually blink your eye, okay? So that eye blink is, should be our normal regular contraction, but that, that twitch is the fibrillation, that wiggle. Once you have that AFib, that's what counts as being an AFib, even if you can't feel it, okay? And that's where we start getting our, our complications. Another thing that you may hear about is something called a rapid ventricular response. And this is typically what people think of when they think of AFib, that they have this really fast, really irregular heart rate. That is true, but that is part of AFib. So as these signals are swirling around the atrium, if one of them happens to swing by and hit that AV node that we talked about that catapults the signal around the ventricle, it does just that. That AV node is not very smart. So anytime a signal goes by, whether it's a good signal or a bad signal, it just reacts. So it'll catapult, 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 and just keep doing it around and around and around. So you get this very fast heart rate, very uncomfortable, and that's typically when people feel their symptoms when it's going fast. But that's one of the very important things that we understand as of the last few years. Even if we're not in that rapid response, you can still be in AFib and still get the complications even when you can't feel it. So that will be important soon. So when we're, we're thinking again of what fibrillation is like, I like to think of it instead of that nice wave, we're thinking of a boiling pot of water. So it's bubble, bubble, moving all over like that. All right, so now that we've talked about what AFib is, let's talk about why and what happens in your heart and why is it so hard to control. So we're gonna talk about pathophysiology, big medical word. So pathology means a disease state and physiology is how something works in your body. So when we talk about pathophysiology, it's when something disease-wise is not working right in your body. So there are a lot of reasons AFib can come around, a lot of reasons that it can be very hard to treat and very hard to, to go away. We call it refractory, meaning it's just very pesky. Basically, all of these reasons circle around the fact that AFib can make scar develop in your heart and that disrupts the circuit. So like I was saying, muscle conducts electricity, scar does not. So when you have scar tissue, it's not muscle, it can't squeeze, it can't conduct electricity, it's just like a bar of, of cement that sits there. So that can disrupt our normal circuit of how things are supposed to be coordinated through the heart. It has to figure out how to reroute around it. Sometimes that signal runs right into scar if it's big, it can't go anywhere, so it kills the signal. That lets other bad signals have time to take a foothold. Um, other conditions that make your heart work harder, like hyperthyroidism, uh, sleep apnea, obesity, that all gets your heart ramped up. It can make your heart stretch some. Same thing with heart failure, valve disease that makes your heart stretch out and enlarge. All of these things can stretch out that electrical circuit and make it so the, um, the conduction pathway gets messed up. Okay, so it becomes very unpredictable. And then as that scar gets worse, the stretching gets worse, that makes our conduction worse, which then makes the scar worse, makes the stretching worse, and it just becomes a really bad cycle that can be very difficult to fix. Now, as of the last few years, we've, we've come up with a better understanding of what's happening in the heart, and luckily, come up with ways to treat your AFib based on what part is happening in your heart. So early on, with AFib, we know from some very, very fancy mapping that electrophysiologists can do, and that's a specialized type of cardiologist that deals with the electrical system of the heart. We know that when you first get AFib, 
it usually comes and goes, comes and goes, and that's called paroxysmal, okay? So it's our early intermittent kind of AFib. And that almost always starts as that little cluster of bad cells, and they're sitting one spot in the heart, and they just go off like a little strobe light or Morse code going off in there. And they send out their signals, and they turn off, and they turn on, but it comes from one spot. So that spot is typically, from the studies they've done, sitting right on the back of the left side of your atrium where your veins from your lungs come in. So that comes in handy when we're talking about how we can fix this. Now, around the six month mark of having AFib, if we can't get it knocked out in that early phase, which is the best chance we have to get rid of it, things start to change. So like we just talked about, we have scar tissue, we have stretching, and a lot of times that isn't always reversible. So as that starts changing, that conduction pathway gets messed up and it goes from having those little signals that are coming out from one spot to something new called a rotor. And that's more like a tornado that's swirling around and around the heart. So it can just whip up out of nowhere. It can start here, but then it's moving. So it's hard for us to catch when we're trying to fix it. Um, we can fix one or we, we try to zap it here, but by then it's over here or a new one can start. So it's just like a tornado and just like a tornado, it's chaos. It just goes all around that atrium. That is called non-paroxysmal or prolonged AFib. And that's where a lot of our new treatments are coming in because that's the people who really have a hard time with symptoms, start having all these changes to their heart and just really have a hard time getting it fixed with our normal ways we've always used. So. Looking at symptoms, how do you know if you're in AFib? How do you know you have it? Typically, you're going to have palpitations, heart racing, heart pounding. That's that typical symptom. But like we were talking about earlier, that happens when that ventricle gets going really fast. So that's when people notice, oh man, I'm having an episode of AFib. People can be in AFib and not feel it. And that is when their heart rate is still not over 100 but it's still in there wiggling, just the top part of their heart's wiggling. So that happens in about 15% of cases, of new cases. We just happen to see it on monitoring because we hooked you up to an EKG for some reason. So that's what makes AFib so dangerous is you can't always tell you're in it. Other things that can happen is that heart sitting, that, that atrium's wiggling, it's not helping pump blood forward. Okay, so that's what we call an atrial kick. It's like our, our turbo boost on a race car. We push that and it kicks blood forward so the ventricle can push it out more. When we lose that, we lose that efficiency of the heart. And that can actually take down um, the efficiency of your heart by about 20% in some people. They can be very sensitive to it. As that heart is holding that blood where it's not pumping forward, again, that starts blowing it up like a balloon. So it starts stretching fluid starts backing up, and that's where we get our complications. When we have that, that's when people have problems getting dizzy, they get short of breath because that pressure backs up on their lungs, their blood pressure can get low, and then also they can just feel really fatigued. So going on to the complications besides just what it makes you feel, let's talk about what we all think of with AFib. When you see a commercial, what's the commercial about? It's not about your heart rate going fast or our conduction pathways. It's about blood clots and it's about strokes. We know AFib is responsible for one out of every five strokes in the US. So it's a huge, huge problem. So it's appropriate that we should be really focused. So how does it happen? Why does AFib cause strokes? So when that blood is just sitting there and it's kind of pooling in the, in the atrium because it can't squeeze it forward as fast, it can cause a clot. So think of when you get a scrape on your arm, what happens if you don't wipe that blood away? It forms a scab, right? Clots forms a scab. The exact same thing happens in your heart. You have a lot of nooks and crannies inside your heart. Um, typically, there's one spot off the back of your heart called your atrial appendage, where most, about 95% of these clots form, but we know that can be the major problem. Unfortunately, these little clots can break free and then they can go in your regular circulation. Typically, the first spot that it, your first stop is up to your brain. It can clog things up and cause a stroke. So the next thing that can happen, though, that doesn't get nearly as much press as strokes is problems with your heart valves and heart failure. So as that blood is staying in that atrium and it's wiggling around, the heart starts stretching. Well, the heart valves are sitting in the middle of your heart to make sure blood's only pumping forward. They're like a turnstile at a train station. Blood should be able to go through, but it can't go back. Well, as that, that valve starts stretching, 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 it can't close all the way anymore, so blood starts leaking back. What does that cause? More stretching, 
what does that cause? More AFib. So it just turns into a bad cycle. The longer you have the stretching, the scar tissue, now it's accelerated by a valve problem, then we get into heart failure. And that's where your heart's been working, it's not efficient, and it gives everything it can, but eventually the muscle itself starts getting tired, your whole heart starts enlarging, and that's when we start getting into problems that may not be reversible on the strength of your heart. So that's why AFib can have a big impact on heart failure. So those are the big scary things that AFib can cause. Okay, so let's talk about how we can help now. Okay, so the, the good stuff. So typically when we're talking about AFib treatment, we're gonna talk about it in two pieces. One, preventing strokes. Like we know that is a huge problem with AFib. So that's its own treatment on itself. Regardless of what we do with trying to fix the heart and slow it down, we wanna prevent those strokes. So part number two though, is trying to get that heart back to normal. Okay, and that normal sinus rhythm ideally, or at least making it so it's slowed down so you're not getting the effects as bad or you're not having as, much, as many symptoms. So talking about our, our stroke issue, the first the treatment nearly everybody is on is anticoagulation, which means blood thinner medication. Typically we start out in the past, it was something Coumadin, Warfarin. There are a lot more um, different medications now that are relatively new. They are not as finicky. Uh, you don't have to check levels all the time. Things like Eliquis um, is typically our first one we try. There's different types though. So if you're not on Eliquis, as long as you're on a blood thinner, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just you know, not the most common one, but your, your cardiologist likely has a good reason why they pick that one. Um, a lot of times people ask, hey, I'm on an aspirin, is that enough? Unfortunately, it's not enough in this circumstance. And aspirin only takes care of your platelet cells that start clots, but we need to really thin out that blood to prevent that stroke. So unfortunately, aspirin usually is not enough. Um, the reason why people have to stay on this medication, like we talked about, is sometimes you don't know when you're an AFib. So you may think, oh, you know what? I've been feeling better. We got it under control. I should be able to come off my blood thinners. Since we sometimes can't tell when we're in it or it's still in there wiggling, even though we're not getting that rapid heart rate, we still need to stay on it because some studies have shown that clots can form in your heart within five minutes of being an AFib. So it was very important on that. Now blood thinner medications are very strong. So we can have problems, especially as we get older, and this is a disease related to age. As we get older, we can have problems with GI bleeding. We can have problems, ulcers. We can have problems if you fall and hit your head. Um, you're going to have bleeding, nosebleeds, all those type of things. So some people just cannot tolerate being on a blood thinner. And there's some special risk calculators that your doctor can look at to decide, okay, is your risk too high? Is your, are you okay? And, and how do we decide that? So if you are one of those people that cannot be on a blood thinner, then we actually have some new technology to help with that. So if you remember back when I was talking about the nooks and crannies inside your heart, there's an area right on the back called the atrial appendage, and it's kind of like an appendix. It's a part of your body, it's there. You don't really need it, but it can cause problems, okay? So basically, it like looks like a little finger, and it's hollow, so blood can get in, but it has a hard time squeezing back out. So it can kind of sit there a little more than other areas of your heart, and we know when blood sits there, it's gonna form a clot, okay? So when we have that, we have two options that luckily are both available here at UT. One is called a Watchman device, and that's when that electrophysiologist goes in in your groin, and he can go up through your heart and put this little plug over into the atrial appendage. So blood can't get in there to form a clot, so we don't worry about that as much anymore. The other option we have is with me, if I'm doing some kind of surgery, it's something called an atriclip, and it's kind of like a... a clip that you put on a bag of chips, I can put that on the outside of your heart if I'm in your chest for some reason, and it pinches it off, almost like when babies have their umbilical cord clamped off. Same thing, it pinches it off, blood can't get in, the area of your heart just shrivels up and turns to scar. We leave that thing in there, it's outside of your heart, it's outside of your bloodstream, we don't have infection problems, so it's a pretty straightforward thing to put in if I'm already in your chest, that's the key. The next thing we look at, you know, when we're done with, okay, we've worked on strokes, let's work on getting that heart better, okay? The first thing a lot of people try is something called rate control. And this is really 
pretty typical that this is what people are going to go with, and it's medication, like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers are the typical ones, and that's to make it so that heart will not go fast as that AFib's happening, and it zips by that, that ventricle, we don't want it to react. So that really helps bring our symptoms down. And what we are getting a better understanding on right now is that still doesn't take away AFib, it just takes away the symptoms. So you can still get some of the complications. So if you're on rate control, you always are on, an, on blood thinner with it. But the studies right now are going saying, oh, do we need to try to push people into a normal sinus rhythm? Some studies way in the past said, well, you know what, survival isn't any different. And when we started really teasing through it, knowing the strokes, knowing the heart failure, knowing the valve problems that AFib can cause, there's thought that the reason the studies didn't show any difference is because sometimes the side effects of the medicines to put you in a normal sinus rhythm can be so bad, they kind of get rid of that benefit for us. So that's when we're gonna talk about some of these new treatments. So if we're trying to get you back into a regular sinus rhythm, so completely get rid of that AFib, the first thing we will try is medication. So typically amiodarone, sometimes you'll hear things like digoxin, ticosin, some, some specialized medicines. They work really well for a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times though, if that AFib keeps coming back, staying on these medicines can make some people feel pretty lousy. So that's when we start thinking of moving on, either if you can't handle the medication itself from side effects, or we're seeing it affect your liver, or, or you know, some of the labs we check for surveillance, or if you're still having symptoms and it's just not working, then we start moving on to things that are a little bit more aggressive. The next thing I'm sure you've heard of is something called a cardioversion. So you, we shock your heart back into rhythm. So the way that works is your heart, that pacemaker, actually has a mind of its own. So your brain does not control the pacemaker on your heart. And a good example of this is when I was in Dallas and doing heart transplants, we would cut out a heart that was all no good, and we we're going to get ready to just send it in the lab. And it would sit on the back table and it can sit there and beat by itself until it runs out of oxygen. And then we take this new heart that's been sitting in ice for four hours and we put it in. We don't have to do anything to shock it back on. We just give it blood supply and on it comes. So the heart wants to beat. That's its job. That's that, pace, that pacemaker's job. So that's what we count on when we're shocking your heart back into rhythm. It's like unplugging an alarm clock and plugging it back in or setting a reset button. So you get some sedation, you get some special stickers put on you, and they conduct electricity, and it gives you a quick shock, makes everything reset, and then lets your heart's pacemaker kick back on. This can be very successful. It can work really well. But sometimes if you already have that pesky form of AFib, that prolonged AFib with the changes in your heart, sometimes this doesn't last. So it can be, you know, sometimes it works for a day, sometimes it works for a week. Um, if you have an early kind, sometimes it works for good, or you know, five years you might need it again. That's great. But these people who are really refractory, where it just, you know, we'd have to shock you and then do it again in a week and do it again in a week. We need something better, and luckily we've come up with it. So the next thing that we move on to if you're still having symptoms is something called an ablation. And there's three different types of ablations we're gonna talk about here. First one is with my colleagues again, the electrophysiologists. And what an ablation is, is where we go in either and we're forming scar tissue. So remember in the beginning, we're saying scar tissue is bad. It doesn't conduct electricity. It makes everything get stretched out and distorted and that conduction system isn't working right. Well, we've decided that we can try to use that scar tissue to our advantage if we put it in the right spots. So we build a wall of scar and that makes it so these signals can't pass through them. We're basically walling them off like they're in jail, okay? So when we talked earlier about that early AFib, where it comes and goes, that paroxysmal kind, we know that the vast majority of people, it starts right in the back of the heart by those pulmonary veins. So the, the electrophysiologists can again go through your groin go up into your heart and they can find those little areas, those veins, easy for them to see because they're big, and they just go in and zap, 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 almost like burning off a wart or freezing off a wart, and they build that scar tissue wall all the way around those veins. So those signals can't come into the heart at all. It just stops them, okay? Now, like I said, this is really good for that early kind of AFib. They have about 90% success long-term of that AFib not coming back if we catch it early enough. The next thing we have is surgical ablation. So that's where I come in. When 
AFib really gets going and we have those rotors and those tornadoes are coming all over, they've gotten out of those pulmonary veins. So just doing that one area, we might have it pop up somewhere else or move and, and things like that. So when I'm in open heart surgery, I can do something that's called a maze. And that's where I take this clamp, which burns, and I also have a probe that freezes. And I literally draw a maze on the heart. I do 13 different burn or freeze lines. And that makes it so the signal from that sinus node has to run through my maze and get to that AV node to go through the ventricle, but all those other tornadoes and signals get lost in the maze, run into the walls and stop, okay? So the maze, it's actually the surgery's been around since the mid 80s. We've really refined the technology on it, but that has, even for those really refractory, those really tough cases, it has about 85, 90% success, okay? If we're talking about those really tough cases, um, if we're trying to do it through the groin with that other ablation, Nationally, it's about anywhere from 30 to 50% success long-term because all the scar tissue and, and those rotors that are still floating around everywhere. So it works some, but it's, you know, we're like, oh, we can do better than that. So, you know, when we look at this, we say, okay, so this maze will work for the early kind. It'll work for the bad kind. We've found our answer. That's great, except for the fact it requires open heart surgery. And only about 3% of people who have AFib need open heart surgery as well. So that is a lot to go through to have a surgical ablation, to have open heart surgery on the heart lung machine, staying in the hospital for a week, all those things. So again, we thought we could do better and we've come up with something. So there is something now called a hybrid maze that we are rolling out here at UT. And that's where my colleagues, the electrophysiologists, we take the best of their world, we take the best of my world and put them together to do a minimally invasive ablation that gets nearly the same results as that big open surgery, okay? So this is for people that have that that refractory disease, you've had it for a while, maybe some of the other things you've tried haven't worked. Okay, so this is the next step. So what we do is we have, um, you come in and it's a two-stage surgery where you come in with me and we take you to the operating room. I don't have to put you on the heart-lung machine. I don't have to open your chest. I make a little incision underneath your breastbone and I have this special camera that can go up, up behind your heart and a special catheter that's called a radio frequency ablation, but basically it burns the very back of your heart. So I'm looking directly at your heart, it's still beating on its own, and I go in there and I do that ablation all along the back wall of your heart. So the goal is to have it so those rotors can't form, okay? And it's not gonna conduct any of the electricity through. That zone of your heart is not your normal pathway, so we're not gonna mess our maze up, okay? Your a, point A can still get to point B, and that'll be fine. So after we do this, we leave a little drain in place, close it up, all the stitches are underneath your skin, and we keep you in the hospital, usually for a day or two. Make sure your heart's behaving, check an echocardiogram, do some typical, some typical studies that we do. Um, in the meantime, between my surgery and the next stage, we still have you on all your medicines. You can still go into AFib because we're not done yet. The second stage, you come in with the electrophysiologist as an outpatient. You're gonna end up going home the same day. He goes up your groin through to your heart and he can finish on the inside of the heart the stuff I couldn't reach from the outside of the heart. Okay, so typically if it's that surgical ablation, the big one, I can get to all parts of your heart because I'm in there with my bare hands and it's open heart surgery and I have you on the heart lung machine. I can't do that unless I have you on the heart lung machine, but they can get to the inside parts. So they go through and they finish all those walls for me. Okay, so that's what our, what our convergent procedure is called. That's a hybrid ablation. Um, typically, like I said, the results are in the 70s up to 80, 85% success in some people of getting rid of that AFib for good. And that's completely getting rid of it. And when we're talking about AFib, even getting the amount you're in, how bad you feel, the medications you have to be on, getting those down is immensely helpful. Um, so all the studies are going on about that now to even see the benefits from that. So the biggest question is, of all these treatments I've talked about, which one's right for you? And that all depends on you. So it will depend on how bad your AFib is, how long have you had it, how bad have your symptoms been, what else have we tried already, and we start low with medicines, and we start building up depending on what you need. So basically, anybody who has symptoms and they've tried some of the other things and they're not working, they would be a candidate for um, the hybrid ablation. 
first question is, can you take a decongestant when you have AFib? Answer is yes, you can. So um, decongestants in general can make your blood pressure a little higher. Any medicine that you have that has the dash D, Claritin D, Allegra D, those things can just make your blood pressure a little higher, makes your heart have to work a little bit harder. If you have very, very difficult AFib to control, your cardiologist may recommend, you know what, you need to stop things that'll kind of ramp up your heart. But in general, that's not gonna be the thing that's really causing your AFib. Similar things that, that we run into if people are really sensitive or their body's under some other kind of stress, really any stress in your body will kick that AFib up. Things like inhalers can kick it up. They're not causing the AFib, but if you're already not feeling good, that can ramp it up. Um, so we watch for different things, caffeine, um, alcohol can, that's another question we actually got, can I drink alcohol with AFib? Um, you can. I'm a big everything in moderation kind of person, but if your body proves to you that you're really sensitive to it, then you need to back off of it. Um, alcohol itself, again, won't cause AFib, but if you drink a lot, if you drink daily, um, it's going to make your heart work harder. So alcohol itself can make your heart have some problems where it enlarges a bit and that the enlargement is causing the AFib. The higher pressures inside your heart are causing the AFib. So alcohol can flare it up. It can make it worse. Um, so again, I'm not saying, no, you could never have wine or a celebration drink, things like that, but you will want to be careful not to do it in excess. Okay. Another question we have is how do I monitor my AFib if I cannot tell when it's out of rhythm? And that's a great question. And that's, that's part of the problem with AFib is you certainly can be in it and not feel it. Um, typically, we just treat you like you're in it. If you have it, that's why we treat you with those blood thinners to protect you so we don't have to worry. Even, you know, like, oh, maybe you had it and we don't have you protected from a stroke. We're going to protect you regardless. Okay. Other things you can do, again, given technology as it's moving forward, um, there are some very good wearables, right? Our watches can show us our heart rate. A lot of times blood pressure cuffs you may have at home, they'll detect heart rate and even give you an alert if you might be an AFib. There are some really good EKG monitors. Um, one is called, that actually my cardiologist recommended to me, is called Cardia, it's K-A-R-D-I-A. -A, and that's just something you can get at Best Buy. It links with your phone and you can do an EKG and it can help you and you can even send the, the result to your cardiologist. Um, so those things are helpful, but they are not necessary. So that's why we're going to treat you like you're in it to keep you safe. Um, another thing that people ask is ways to stay safe, try to, to get rid of their AFib um, or prevent, big prevention. So like I said, AFib is really rampant in the United States because of our lifestyle. So if we try to get out of our routines and our typical lifestyle, um, things of fast food, processed food, uh, high blood sugars, being overweight, being not very active, um, those things definitely help. Uh, there are some studies showing the Mediterranean diet, so non-processed foods, fish, um, good oils, good fats, all of those things are probably the most helpful from an AFib standpoint. But really, anytime you're, you're eating a healthy, well-rounded diet and trying to stay with the fresh stuff and get away from the processed stuff, that's going to help your heart in general. It will also help AFib. Um, one of my favorite things to tell people is there's actually a study that shows if you eat dark chocolate one time a week, your rate of AFib drops by 16%. So I highly recommend everyone eating dark chocolate at least once a week. Um, unfortunately, the study showed there was not an extra benefit if you ate it every day. We hope you enjoyed the presentation today. For more information about scheduling an appointment with Dr. Cooley, call 903-595 6680 or visit uthealthystexasdoctors.com. Our next virtual seminar will be announced soon. Follow us on Facebook to stay up to date on upcoming events and seminars. Thank you for watching.